Hi, good morning. We are continuing our Lent series on creation and this week we're looking at water. I was reflecting on this. I'm going to do a reflection on reflection, actually. But I was, I was thinking about this and I remember um, as a child in the UK, there was quite a lot of life around the shores of, of the coast. Even if you didn't see the actual creatures, you would see evidence by the amount of shells and things on the shore. But over my lifetime, that's changed quite a lot, uh, especially off the, the south coast of England, where the waters are not beautiful. They're not clear and crystal clear like they are here. I, I love wading and I love wading, especially around here where the waters are incredibly clear. And you can see this picture here, um, which I took when I was wading one day. It's just, it's just like a little piece of heaven, isn't it? Um, and here's another picture I came across some of the wildlife, or one little chap who, who lives in the waters, but you can see how beautifully clear the water are, are there. And this next slide, you can hardly tell there's water there at all, apart from the fact that the seaweed is not lying flat on the ground. It's just beautiful, beautiful here. I'd like it to stay that way in Canada and, and the life to continue to be teeming in the waters here, because it's wonderful. And the Bible talks about the waters teeming with life. And also in the, the Revelation reading I looked at, was it last week or the week before? We looked at how clear, the crystal clear waters flowed from the throne of God. Now, my reflection on reflection is this. When I was in the church in Wales and I was going to be moving from a fairly comfortable rural Welsh parish um, to do pioneer ministry in a town and my focus was to be in an area that was quite deprived. There was lots of unemployment, people didn't have a whole lot of money and I was to be working with people who didn't come to church but who lived in that community as a way of bringing the church out into the community if you like. And as I was preparing to make that move I was, I was walking and praying as I do and in Wales, there's no shortage of puddles on the ground. And I saw this puddle, which was near a farm of one of our parishioners. And I was just looking into the water and all the kind of the mud and the slime that builds up and, and, a, and a puddle was there. And, and I just sensed God saying to me really that I was moving into that kind of environment where things were not clear, they were not good. It was the mix and the kind of mess of life was there and, and that's what I was being called into. And then my eyes changed focus. You, you know how you can kind of, you just refocused your eyes. And I realized that even when I was looking down at that puddle, what I could see also in that, in that puddle was the reflection of the sky. And the sky was blue and full of fluffy white clouds. And it was also, also, also almost like God was saying to me that my, my kingdom, my heaven is there even down there where things are difficult and things are a bit of a mess, you can find my kingdom. Because God meets us in the waters. And we see in scripture, water occurs over and over again, you know, it, come, it crops up a lot, whether God is bringing water forth from the rock, whether the water is flowing from his throne, clear as crystal. He holds back the waters, he restores the waters, and he gave us the living water, who is Jesus Christ, our Lord. So what we know through the waters is that God is here and his kingdom is with us now. Amen. Thank you, Sulin. Um, today, as we've indicated, we're going to be talking about water. Water in our readings today, you can see many times it's brought up in the Bible, from cleansing of the spirit, baptism, rebirth. So the Christian church and the church before the Christian church believe water was important. Thank you. Next slide, please. As you can see, humans are made up of 70% water. So you can see a reason why people have always focused on water as something. You can be without food for several days, weeks, but water, you cannot survive. Next slide, please. This is a photo of the Puntledge River near Nymph Falls. And I want to tell you why we're going to be focusing today only on, on the Comox Valley, 
because uh, this is a huge global issue. We could be spending hours on this, but we don't have time today. So in the few minutes we have, we'll focus here on the uh, Comox Valley. We can talk further about water issues elsewhere on the planet. And even in our own country, we have drinking water issues we must address. But for now, we'll focus here on the Comox Valley. This photo shows you a winter rainstorm here on the Punt Ledge River. You would not think we would have water problems, but we certainly seem to. Next slide, please. This is uh, Comox Lake. Uh, big dam that's been installed there. Make sure we should have adequate supply. But as you all know, we do have times where we have to restrict water consumption. Next slide, please. The glacier. You can see this is a photo during the winter and there's lots of white snow up there, ice. You think we'd, we should be well stocked. We're a community with a glacier, a lake, a huge river. Um, but now, next slide. If we take a look at what this glacier looks like in the summer, you can see that it has shrunk very markedly. Next slide, please. This picture was provided to me by Dan Seberg. He took it in September 1989. And what you can see, you can see people walking across the back, the west side of the glacier, and there's a big rock shelf, but between the top of the ice and the rock shelf, there's 10 or 12 feet of ice. So you can see the glacier was quite huge at that time. Next slide, please. This, you can now see what the glacier looks like now. The, it's basically level with the rock shelf. We've lost that 10, 12 feet of ice. So you can really see how that glacier has shrunk. Why has it been shrinking? That's what we need to address now. Next slide, please. This is the slide indicating the heat dome that we had in 2021, 38 degrees here in Comox, almost 40 in Campbell River, and almost 50 degrees in Lytton, BC. You saw the fires that followed this because of the extreme drought that was taking place. Later that year, we also had a new term in our lexicon, that was atmospheric rivers these huge rainstorms that just flooded us and our, our streams could not hold them. They flooded the Fraser Valley, causing billions of dollars in damage. Next slide, please. This is the Vancouver Island map provided by BC Environment showing where level five drought is seen in Southern BC. You can see Level five is all of Vancouver Island and uh, some parts in the interior, but this is surprising, particularly for Vancouver Island. We're supposed to be a West Coast <coughs> rainforest, and here we have a level five drought. Next slide, please. This is uh, Ramparts Creek on the Mount Washington Road. These are, this is old growth forests that have been cut down in October of this year. This is in the middle of a biodiversity and climate crisis. And here we have logging taking out the last old growth in the watershed that is not inside a park. This is unacceptable. Old growth forests hold water during heavy rains, during runoff times in the spring, preventing floods and providing waters when we need it. Next slide, please. This is the sign that we've all seen from the Comox Valley Regional District, warning us which level we're supposed to be, uh, rich restrictions we have to be following. As you move up the series one, two, three, and four, uh, you, you have to restrict your use even more. But, but as you can see, we're always in level one. The next thing, we spend most of our time in level three when we can water very little. With these challenges, what can you do? And the key thing is, is you can use lower flow uh, showers, you know, low flow shower heads, toilets use less, that use less water, appliances that use less water. 
So those are the kinds of things that you can do as well. Also, on the, in looking after your outdoor watering, uh, you can have less grass. And if you do feel that you need to have some grass, you can restrict it to only one inch of watering per week. The other issue is you can, it's called nature scaping, selecting the kind of plants you have in your yard. Are they locally adapted to this environment so they need less water? You can also consider how, do you, how you can install water storage units, rain barrels, water cisterns that can be installed in the ground or on your roof. You can also do things like checking for leaks, you know, uh, dripping taps, uh, leaking hoses, all that sort of thing. So, and finally, I think we need to be contacting our local and regional politicians. Right now, they're proposing 700 new homes for the Comox. So, what, do we have water for 700 new homes, 1,400 new people? That's a good question. And it's something that our politicians need to be addressing before we start adding new people in the valley. So I hope I've given you some ideas to think about and we can talk about more of these later. Thank you very much.